Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the day that you've given us, for the way that you've cared for us and watched over us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has forgiven our sins even today and who has done so with, with willingness and with joy and with gladness. Father, we thank you that uh, your goodness and your graciousness to us comes to us new every morning and we thank you that uh, even today we can spend this time once again seeking the wisdom of your Holy Spirit through your word to enable us to know how to care for others, how to be a blessing in the hearts and lives of other people and as we consider uh, <coughs> the uh, the young adults that we know in our lives and in our churches and uh, as we look uh, <coughs> at that stage in our own lives, Father we pray that you would give us a depth of insight and understanding that will enable us to to draw alongside with comfort and with grace and uh, so press the life of Christ down into the hearts of people who struggle and groan under the weight of sin and a fallen world. So we thank you for our time together and we commit our hearts to you in Christ's name. Amen. This is our second lecture on early adulthood, the 20s and 30s. Here's a quote from uh, Carter McGoldrick. In early adulthood, the family of origin is faced with the need to continue to let go its power and control on the young adult as he or she develops financial independence, residential independence, career development, spiritual independence, and in the forming of a new independent from the family relationships. The freedom to make choices about relationships, sex, and cohabitation, totally free from parental scrutiny or supervision, is often a more serious threat to parents' sense of closeness with their child. Actually, a little bit in italics is the, uh, is the quote from McGoldrick. Now, this kind of picks up on what we were talking about last week about family of origin issues with the young adult in their 20s and 30s having to separate from the family of origin. And um, the family of origin is, is faced with the struggle to let go their power and control on the young adult. Now, as we consider the transition experienced by the young adult, we can discern possible counselling issues for the people we will see in our counselling ministry. Issues we, we, we do not have experiences of personally and issues that may not arise in the spiritually mature young adults and their families of origin that we know, but issues we may encounter in the wider community. In other words, my concern in this course is not only to equip you to look with insight into your own issues of crisis and transition as you've gone through the life stages, um, nor is it simply to equip you to minister within the local church with people like yourselves perhaps who have grown up in covenant families and uh, have experienced uh, similar issues and struggles and tensions as they've gone through the life stages. But in addition to those two things, to actually be, um, be able to position yourself in such a way that you can minister to the wider non-Christian community, that you would see this counselling ministry as having an evangelistic or missional aspect to it, so that as you, as you step out and offer yourself to a non-Christian community and culture in which we live, I want you to be equipped as best we can for what you might encounter. And what you might encounter will be very different possibly from the issues that you faced when you went through this and very different from the issues you may face within your Christian culture. We don't know what the Lord's going to do with your gifts, with your ministry heart for people, uh, but what we do know is that the Great Commission is not only to go among the unbelievers but also to disciple the believers. And so. There's the two aspects you see to this training. And so as we look at this, uh, this 
uh, information about the young adult life stage, for instance, and we look at some of the secular writers, what we're doing is we're acquainting ourselves with both the experiences and the understandings that the general non-Christian young adult in our culture will come to you with. They'll come to you as a counsellor with experiences that uh, you'll only find in secular literature. They'll, they'll come to you with convictions and understandings which you will only find in secular literature. So to be acquainted with that and to have given some thought to that and, and to a biblical response to that means that when they come to you, you'll be ready. You'll be ready to receive them just as you might receive a, uh, a Christian seeker from your church fellowship. Now, believer or unbeliever is faced with the same tension as a young adult to separate from the family of origin. That's common to both believer and unbeliever. And the tensions the family of origin will face as the young adult, the 20, 30, 20s and 30 year olds uh, prepare to leave the family of origin will be similar tensions whether they're a believing family or non-believing family. The difference of course is the way the family of origin and the young adult uh, will deal with those tensions as to whether they're believers or unbelievers. And our job is to identify with the, with the transition to identify with the transition as they go from one to the other and the crisis that may eventuate along with that transition and to be able to anticipate the crisis, to be able to understand the contours of the crisis, to be able to anticipate uh, the, uh, the struggles that might go with that. So that will help you with your questions and uh, help you to process the answers. So as the young adult is developing financial independence, residential independence, seeking to live away from the home, career development, spiritual independence and in the forming of new independent from the family relationships and, and you know how it is with the, 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 um, the one who leaves high school and, uh, and uh, begins to get a job and they're looking forward to going flatting and so uh, late teens, early twenties they, they go flatting and they can't get away, wait to get away and within five years they realize they don't have the financial wherewithal to pull it off or the flat, flatmates leave and you know they're on their own and so they they have to come back to the family of origin and the family of origin sent them off and the family of origin turned their bedroom into a, into a den for dad you see in other words, the family of origin have, have kind of, it appears, closed off, closed ranks and closed the gap and now see, they're out, now they've got to come back and dad's got to give up his den, they've got to put a bed back in there and, and uh, now they've got to put up with a, with a young adult who's had an experience of being away from home and has come back and, and they're not quite the same person that left. You see, they're five years or so away, of, they've grown up and... You know, they've learnt to get their own meals and so they're in the kitchen where mum's trying to prepare food and they don't want the food mum's prepared, they want their own food. And, and so you see this residential independence, it's just not straightforward in a lot of situations. Uh, <clears throat> the freedom to make choices about relationships, sex and cohabitation, totally free from parental security or supervision. Now that may not be such an issue, um, oh, sorry Michelle, here we go, that may not be such an issue uh, for the Christian young people that you're involved with, but you, you know your society well enough, there's a lot of cohabitation out there. And uh, I've got some secular research here on cohabitation, which we'll just uh, look at briefly. Given today's high divorce rate, many young people want to be sure that the person they marry is someone they will want to be with for the rest of their lives. Thus, it's a relatively common today for couples to live together before marriage. Many such couples conceive of cohabitation as the final filter, a sort of test before marriage. Can we really get along together? Are we sexually compatible? Now, if you, if you want to take your, 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 your ministry calling and training as a counsellor, beyond the confines of the church, to have a ministry of mercy in the unbelieving culture, then these are the kind of issues that you'll be dealing with. And so you might have a 
You might have a couple come to you for couple counselling and they're not married. They're cohabitating and they want couple counselling. What are you going to do with them? You're going to say, well, I'd only see you as individuals because <laughs> you're not married. Or are you going to treat them as a couple and what are you going to do? Well, now here's some of the, uh, here's some of the secular research on this whole issue of cohabitating. In Levison's terms, they believe that cohabitation will lessen the likelihood of divorce because it will provide them with an opportunity to build a life structure they can use in adapting to marriage. Interestingly, the great bulk of the evidence shows exactly the opposite. So here's a secular research to show that in fact cohabitation doesn't make for stable long-term relationships. Now we can say, well, we've known that all along, you know, from the Bible, but this is Non-Christians come into that conclusion. You see, and so here you are talking to this couple who are living together and, and um, uh, they may or may not be that receptive to biblical instruction, but see, here's some things you can give them to think about, about their situation. Studies in the United States and Canada and European countries such as Sweden all show that those who cohabit before marriage are less satisfied with their subsequent marriages and more likely to divorce than those who marry without cohabitating. And there's the references for the research. The most likely explanation of this surprising set of findings is twofold. First, cohabitating leads to development of a life structure for cohabitating, not for marriage, because the two relationships are fundamentally different. For example, moving in together is seldom accompanied by public announcements and celebratory fanfare that are associated with marriage. Further, cohabitating couples regard their relationships as ambiguous in nature. They may or may not be permanent. In contrast, a marriage involves a public declaration of lifelong commitment to another person. Thus, when a cohabitating couple marries, the social and psychological aspects of the relationship change because of the deepened sense of commitment and the expectation that the relationship is permanent. It's a different kind of relationship, a cohabitating relationship and a marriage relationship. And if you go from one to the other with the same partner, you may often go into marriage without realising in fact you're crossing a relationship boundary from a relationship which is somewhat ambiguous to one that is far more permanent in its expectations. Um, I was watching a TV show last week and this guy gets his girlfriend pregnant and he announces to his workmates that his girlfriend is pregnant and someone says to him, well, are you going to get married? And he has this kind of shocked look on his face and he says, oh no, we're not going to rush into anything. <laughs> They've already rushed into a lot. Yeah. See, the, you see the idea was to rush into marriage was a serious thing. Far more serious than rushing into a cohabitating sexual relationship. Second, second reason why um, those who uh, cohabitate are less likely to have a satisfactory marriage, the second reason is that adults who choose to live together before marriage are different in key ways from those who marry without cohabitating. In other words, if you're looking for someone to just to cohabitate with, you'll look for a different kind of person than the one you're looking for to get married to. So the one you cohabitate with may not be the one you want to spend the rest of your life with. For example, cohabitating couples are less homo, homo gamous than married couples. Couples in which partners are of a different race, religion, educational levels and socioeconomic statuses are more likely to cohabitate prior to marriage. In other words, cohabitating couples tend to be quite different from one another. Whereas in marriage, you tend to choose someone that is more similar to you because you have a different objective in mind. Your objective is a, is a long-term relationship, so you look for someone that you're more likely to be happy with long-term. This is what the, uh, the research is finding. Uh, uh, Homogamy contributes to relationship stability, thus the difference in marital stability between cohabitants and non-cohabitants may be a matter of self-selection, not the result of some casual process attributable to cohabitation itself. As appealing as the idea of a trial marriage might be, there appears to be no way to adjust a marriage before one is actually married. <laughs> you can't prepare for marriage. Any way to prepare for marriage is to get married. 
The best a couple can do is examine their relationship in the light of what researchers have discovered about the characteristics of stable marriage, as you'll read about later in the chapter. Okay, so that's just uh, um, something that other people are saying about cohabitating. So you're talking to this couple, and they're looking for some uh, relationship counselling from you, and they're living together without the blessing of a of a God-sanctioned marriage. And so you're, you're now asking them questions about um, about their objective for their relationship. If they've come to you for couple counselling, does that mean they're, they're, they're wanting this relationship to be long-term? Is there a sense of permanency that's developed in their thinking? Is that why they're coming for couple counselling? Why don't you, if you're having trouble, why not just separate and find someone else to cohabit with? You see, why aren't they doing that? It's the very fact they're coming to you tells you something, doesn't it? That they're, they're, they're thinking beyond cohabitating now to perhaps something a little more permanent. Well, the young adult knows themselves to have the freedom to make those kind of choices. Now, a, a, a Christian young adult also knows though they have those same choices, but, but they will subject those choices to the requirements of Scripture. Even though they find themselves increasingly free from parental security, uh, uh, scrutiny or supervision. They may not be free from parental scrutiny, but they're free from parental supervision. You see, the parents are trying to scrutinise everything that's going on in the young adult's life, but the young adult, knowing themselves free from supervision, uh, resists that scrutiny as they feel the growing power of choice. Uh, <clears throat> this can offer a more serious threat to parents' sense of closeness with their child. The parent begins to panic, thinking they're losing their child. Now this is true not only for Christians, but for non-Christian parents. As they see their child's growing independence, they begin to panic, they're losing their child. Now you can imagine for Christian parents, as they see the children exercising, the young adult exercising that profound sense of independence and freedom, and perhaps making choices that one they don't agree with, or choices that they only suspect but don't know about. You see, it, it's a crisis. The transition of the young adult from adolescence produces a crisis for the parent, for the family of origin. The young adult may develop anxiety about their new freedoms and the tasks they entail and may find themselves separating in order, exp order to experiment with these freedoms. Well, the uh, can't wait to leave home. The young adult will often see this time of transition as an opportunity to redo their past relationships with their family of origin and attempt to make up for past losses. Uh, the, the, the idea behind that is that if, if the young adult gets to their 20s and 30s and realises with a shock that they've passed through childhood, they've passed through adolescence, and they've come now to adulthood feeling a, a, a significant deprivation in, their, um, in the way that they've been raised. A significant deprivation in the parenting they've experienced. Perhaps, you know, perhaps their parents uh, separated and divorced when they were, you know, in late childhood, early, early adolescent. And, and, and through adolescence the child has, has experienced a profound disappointment in, in what they've lost in the, in the whole parenting opportunity. That perhaps the parenting they experienced back here when their children, when their parents were together, is something they feel they've lost here. In adolescence, they didn't have a whole lot of choice about the custody arrangements, for instance. But now, as a young adult, you see with that residential freedom, with that financial freedom, with that relational freedom, uh, <coughs> they may now take the opportunity to try to have another bite at the cherry, to try to get that reparenting. And so it's not Unusual, for instance, you see, if, if they've grown up, say, with their mother and their father's in another city, that with the chance to leave home, they'll go and find the father and, and, and want to live with him for a while, you see, and, and try to make up what they've lost back here. Sometimes um, they, uh, <coughs> if the parents haven't separated, but the child still feels, the young adult still feels a sense of deprivation that they've missed out on something with the with the, uh, the parent, and it may be, you know, a, a sibling thing, you know, well, here's was the favoured child and I wasn't that favoured or whatever, and, 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 and now here's a chance to, to have it made up because 
perhaps the favourite child has gone off to another city and, and, and uh, so the next sibling is left kind of in the same city and uh, uh, so now here's their chance to kind of step into that favoured position and get that reparenting. You see this very much in, in here, in adolescence, you see when the young adult leaves home and the next one down who's still an adolescent suddenly now gets all the goodies that the oldest child had, gets their bedroom, gets a room to themselves and maybe even an ensuite to themselves and, and, and now they can uh, begin to enjoy the goodies, the fruits of, a, of, of the parents' resources being focused on them, zeroed in on them. So you're, you know, as you, um, often you'll find yourself with these situations having family conferences and bringing them all together and asking these kinds of questions of the family and listening to how they respond. Perhaps the most common issue in early adulthood in the 20s and 30s is the issue of relationships. The young adult is transitioning from the relationship with his or her family of origin while searching for a new relationship of romance and intimacy. Another way of saying that is the great task of young adulthood is to find a mate. Well, that's secular language. It's to find a mate, someone to spend their life with, someone to have babies with, someone who could be a significant other in their lives. Now, remember up until here, the significant others in their lives have been their caregivers, their family of origin. Now, as they separate from that family of origin and they step out into the brave new world, flexing all their newfound independence, they're very aware of the fact that they need to find someone to share this with. They don't want to be on their own. As they step out of their family of origin, whatever that family of origin was like in terms of upbringing, they're stepping away from close relationship and they want to step toward another close relationship. They don't want to be bereft of someone in their life with whom they can share this newfound freedom. Now remember as an adolescent their peers were becoming more and more important to them. See back here it's the parents who determine everything you know what you eat and what you're going to wear when you leave the house you don't leave the house. Here the adolescent is learning from their peers about what they should be eating and what they should be wearing and how they should be wearing their hair and whether their shirt should be out or tucked in and you know they let their peers to determine that. You see so by the time they get to young adulthood they're very ready now to be more peer involved than family of origin involved. Now they're ready you see to find a peer that they can spend their life with. You see how they've transitioned from an rel intimate relationship here to an intimate relationship with someone outside of the family. Now that's the great task of 20 and 30s is to replace the relationship of intimacy they have lost by moving away from family of origin. See they haven't lost the relationship with family of origin, what they've lost is the intimacy with family of origin they endured in their growing up years. The search is for a new relationship in which one can share oneself openly, expecting and receiving acceptance and support. Now that's secular language, you know, if we're talking biblically we'll talk about um, uh, someone who loves Christ, someone that you, you can share a uh, commonality of faith and desire to serve and minister in the name of Christ and the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ, someone who understands you and loves you in the Lord. For the unbeliever, the search for the new relationship in which one can share oneself openly, expecting and receiving acceptance and support. Now, we all have that in common. In this search, friends and peers become very important and play a significant role in mate selection. So a, a 20 year old female is at a party with her, with her girlfriends and uh, she meets a guy at the party. Now, after the party, who does she go to talk to about that guy, that, that interesting guy she met? Who does she go to to talk about, talk about it? Well, as a 16-year-old, she may have gone home and talked to her mother. But as a 22-year-old, she's going to talk to her friends who are at the party with her. Well, did you see that cute-looking guy over in the corner there? What do you think about him? See? And that's where the conversation goes. You see how important peers become in, in, in selecting a mate. In other words, the, the, the peers that you've chosen to associate with are the peers that you feel most commonality with. 
And the ones that you feel the most commonality with are the ones that will have the greatest impact on your own decision making. Because your reason that these people think like you and they decide like you and they, they come to their, to, to their decision making about problems the same way that you do and so your peers then are the natural ones to say, oh well he's no good or he's quite nice and, and, and you see that becomes a very powerful voice. Well, that's a long way from arranged marriages isn't it? Where the parents have the controlling voice about who they marry. Um, just recently I was involved in doing some marriage counselling with an Indian couple who had been married uh, uh, 12 years and for the 10 years of that 12 years they had been fighting constantly. He sent me an email and he said we've been fighting for 10 years, I'm desperate, we need help. And it turned out it was an arranged marriage. Uh, they were Christians, both came from Christian families, and yet in that Indian culture, even though they were Christians, the parents arranged the marriage. And, and so when they met, you know, she prayed and she could come up with no good biblical reason for not marrying him. Nothing about being in love. No good biblical reason for not marrying him. So she married him. Now 12 years later she's saying, I'm committed to this marriage. God won't let me divorce him. But what she's not saying is, I want to know how to love this man and grow in intimacy with him. She's not saying that. In other words, she's hunkering down for the long term because this is what God wants, right? Well, see, that's not a marriage that reflects the relationship of Christ with the church. But there's a, there's a situation where um, the family of origin determined mate selection. Now, that doesn't mean to say those marriages can't work any more than marriages which are determined by peer involvement. Well, as the peers become more important and play a significant role in mate selection, parents can become very reactive. The task for the whole family is to allow the new attachments outside the family to bring a redefinition and a realignment to the young adult's relationship with his or her family of origin. Oh no, who's she bringing home this time? Oh no, who's he hooked up with this time? You see, and so what happens is the, 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 the 20, or 30, uh, 20 to 30 year old who's living away from home, uh, they, um, uh, they come home for dinner and they want to bring someone with them and uh, so if it's a son he walks in with this young lady, if it's a young lady she walks in with this young bloke and, and, and what's the family, what are the parents, what are the parents to do with that? Well they have to kind of realign themselves with this new reality. Now is this one going to last longer than the, than the last one? Is this going to be permanent? Is this going to be the mother, father of my grandchildren? How should I relate to this one? And so well, you know, time goes by and, and this one is around a bit more longer than some of the other ones. Well maybe this is going to be a go, maybe this one will be a star and they seem to be getting along well and so you're getting to know them and, and, and you're getting to quite like them and you're beginning to form an attachment to them as a parent, you know, to this young woman who's with your son or this young man who's with your daughter and, and you're beginning to think about them as, as a long-term part of your family. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, comes the announcement, oh, we've broken up. We've broken up. <laughs> and suddenly, you've lost them, you've lost the relationship, you've lost the dreams that perhaps you're beginning to dream and it's just been snatched away from you by your young adult and the young adult has no idea you see when they left home at 18 they walked out the door and took 18 years of your life with them and they were gone now you see they bring this person around and now the person's not around and a few weeks a few months later someone else turns up with them you got to start the process all over again you see it's uh, it may not be a crisis for the young adult, it may be a crisis for the family of origin. So in order to help the young adult with this task of mate selection, what can the family of origin do to help the young adult with this most important of tasks? Well I've got a few bullet points there suggest uh, uh, what it requires from the family of origin to help with the accomplishing of this task. Uh, 
First, an ability to tolerate separation and independence on the behalf of the on behalf of the young adult while remaining connected. Uh, how much separation and independence can the family of origin tolerate? So, for instance, you might have a um, you might have a situation where uh, the twenty year old uh, daughter leaves home and she leaves behind some young uh, young sisters, siblings who um, who have been very attached to her over the years, and and uh, she's been very involved with them, and uh, and suddenly she's gone, and these younger siblings are kind of left somewhat bereft, a, almost like a, a parent type figure has left them, and and this not only has this parent type figure left them, but they're they they they've formed other relationships with other people, and perhaps with a young man, and 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 so the the siblings are left not knowing where that leaves them. And it's going to take a whole period of years to get all that realignment sorted. So when those younger siblings grow up and they get married and they have families and the older sister's now married and she's got a family and they all get back together and they kind of realign themselves around the new reality. You see, as that transition's completed, but in the course of the transition, there's a crisis there. Um, an ability to tolerate separation and independence while remaining connected. Now, some family of origins have no tolerance ability at all for separation and independence from the young adult. Others go the other way and can't wait to see the back of them and you've gone, you've made your bed, you've got to lie on it, you know, and, and uh, you know, we turn your bedroom into a den, you see, that sort of thing. To remain connected, to, to uh, be ready to wave them goodbye and be ready to receive them back, to maintain that dual stance with integrity. To tolerate uh, tolerance for the differences and ambiguity in the new identities of the young adult. Uh, this young adult may be developing to someone very different from what the parents had in mind. Um, and uh, are they ready to tolerate that? Um, the, what often happens is it's not it's not an intense dislike or an intense like. It's more you just feel uh, ambiguous about it all. Well, it's I guess it's okay, but it's not really what we had in mind, and and we're a bit concerned about where it's all going to lead if she or he stays on this track, and w we just don't know what to do with it. Should we say something? Should we not say something? Should we, uh, you know, as Christian parents and their their 20 year old goes off and, and moves in with his or her boyfriend or girlfriend, they're living together and the Christian parents are saying, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? When they come to visit, do we let them sleep in the same bed? Do we insist on separate bedrooms? What do we do? See, it's a crisis. It's a crisis for the parent. It can be a crisis for the young couple because you don't want to be separated because, you see, they're, they're living together as husband and wife in their minds. So. Uh, and, and the parents are saying, well, should we say anything? I mean, if we say anything and upset him or set, upset her, we may never see the grandchildren. You see, they might just get all huffy and, and, and move to another country <laughs> or move to another city or go to Australia with the other thousand a week and we'll never see them. And we have to go across the Tasman and see the grandchildren. So, you know, see, see, the, see the, the, the ambiguity. On one hand, they, they feel it's wrong and they're very disappointed and they want to express their disappointment somehow, but on the other hand, they don't want to upset their son and his new girlfriend or their daughter and, his, and their new boyfriend and because they're thinking about the long term and, 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 you know, maybe they will get married eventually, you see, and have children. So should we just put up with it until then? And then she dumps them and moves them with someone else. See, and all starts all over again. Well, those might be issues, uh, you know, for, for counselling issues. And see, you might be talking to those parents after church, you know, with a cup of tea. Well, how are things going with, with Sally? You know, Sally is, you know, 20 something and has left home. And how are things going with Sally? You know, and, and, and the mother kind of has this kind of stricken look on her face. She was hoping you wouldn't ask that question. She's hoping she could get away with not having to tell you that Sally's uh, uh, moved to uh, moved to Sydney and living with her boyfriend. And uh, so, what are you going to say? What are you going to say to that mother?
you just divulge that, divulge that piece of information. Understanding some of these things. What are you going to say to her? What stance are you going to take? Councillors of the church? Okay, very good. How's that for you? Mm. That must be really difficult. Yeah. Okay, very good. Your concern is for the mother. Sally's in Sydney, so you can't talk about Sally without gossiping, so talk about the mother. Now, bearing in mind, you see, what we're looking here, the, the ambiguity. Uh, the ambiguity and the new identities of the young adult. So, the mother is feeling a mixture of things, isn't she? What might be some of the mixture of things that she might be feeling? Guilt. Okay, guilt. What else? Concern, anxiety. Anxiety? Okay. Frustration. Angry. Okay. She might be angry with Sally. Might be feeling guilty. What would you be feeling anxious about? Perhaps. Well, in, in a broad sense, she's just she has no control. Before That's right. She had her, her, she could kind of lock the door, or you, know, <laughs> you had to yell at the person in the room with a with a some sort of stick. But now, it's as a complete distance and isolation. So. Really, absolutely. And so she's feeling she's feeling. Um, anxiety for a daughter, but she's feeling anxiety for herself. She's feeling anxiety about where's my relationship with Sally going to go? Which direction is it going to head in? Have I lost her? Will I get her back? What does this mean for my relationship with Sally? She had to kind of, the power's been transferred. Like she had the power, but now it's actually the daughter's got the power, actually. Very good. She's powerless. And, and, and what about... <coughs> What do people generally feel when they suddenly find themselves powerless? Particularly in relationship. What, what, where do they go emotionally when they find themselves powerless? They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable. They're insecure. Insecure. Perhaps a little bit panicky. Mm -hmm. With a loss of power, there's nothing you can do. You're at the mercy. She's at Sally, at the mercy of Sally, and, and Sally probably has no idea what's going on in her mother's heart right now. She's just enjoying her newfound residential freedom and relational freedom. So as you're talking to, to this mother, you're going to be uh, looking out for this, this uh, tumult of emotions that this woman is struggling with and, and certainly probably doesn't have the words to put it into, uh, to be able to express what she's feeling, but she's feeling a whole heap of things. And, and, and as, as, she, as she's standing there talking to you, what big decision does she have to make right there and then in this conversation with you? She's just divulged something. Sally's living in Sydney with her boyfriend and you, you are obviously not going to walk away. You're obviously standing there. You're obviously anticipating this conversation to develop. What decision does this mother have to make? Do I want to talk about it? Yeah. Okay. Do, you want to say? <laughs> Do I want to talk? And see, maybe it came as a surprise. Maybe she, you know, she never expected to suddenly find herself at that moment faced with that decision and talking with you. It feels like a crisis, doesn't it? Do I want to open up and just tell everything that I'm feeling, all my guilt, all my shame, all my fear, all my anger? I can hardly understand it myself. Do I want to let it all out now? And, of all these people so now you trained and godly counselor see aware of some of what might be going on in this woman's heart you're going to you're going to what are you going to do to help her at that point 
carry a conversation on over the coffee in the tomorrow and the day after. Yes. You could say something like, well, I can see this is, this is difficult for you and this is perhaps not, a, not the right place to be talking about this, but I would, I would really like to um, hear more about what's going on here for you if you would be willing to do that and could we meet together sometime this week and, and uh, you see, and, and now the mother goes away, you've, you've given her an out and now she's faced with the decision, do I want to talk about what's going on in my heart? But at least you've given her the invitation. You don't know if she will or not. Now, the reason you've given her that invitation is that you understand that the young person's transition has caused a crisis for the mother, plunged the mother into crisis. And the reason you want to meet with the mother is to help her through the crisis, not necessarily to sort out for the mother what she should do about Sally, because she can't do anything about Sally. Sally's an independent person now making her own decisions. You want to help the mother to walk through the mother's crisis as the mother transitions from being a powerful influence in Sally's life to being a powerless influence. What else does it require from the family of origin? Well, for parents to allow their own midlife struggles, identity issues, to elicit sympathy for the young adult. Now, uh, if, if the young adult is, say, 25, how old will the parent be? Well, if the parent uh, could be, um, say, 25 years older than 25, so that's 50, that's put them, puts them about here, okay? So this woman you're talking to is probably about this age here. If her Sally is in her early 20s, she's probably in her mid to late 50s. Have I got that right? Um, and so you, you, w one of the things that's going to help this woman is if what, she's, what is she doing with the issues, her own uh, issues of going from middle adult to young old, using the terminology of, of stage age development. You see, how, how is she shaping up to this, you know, menopause, you know, what's going on for her as she struggles now with what's going on with Sally. And... Uh, um, you see, she, she has her own struggles right here with, with trying to reposition herself with the new reality of, of where she is in, in, in midlife and going on into her 60s. Her 60s are looming like a train crash, you see, and, and how is she dealing with that? And as she, you see, as she, as she struggles with the reality of her transition and as she's honest about that and honest about that struggle, will that help her to be more empathetic for Sally as Sally goes through her transition? You see, the fact that Sally's going through a transition at the same time her mother's going through a transition doesn't mean that it's a double disaster. It could be the other, it could go the other way, that as you help the mother with, with what's going on in her life right now, maybe that will give her a greater capacity to bear with Sally and to offer Sally um, uh, love and care and concern without um, necessarily... Uh, agreeing with what Sally's doing. Uh, here's another one, um, what it requires from the family of origin. Acceptance of the range and variation of the intense emotional attachments and lifestyle, lifestyles developing outside of the family of origin. The range and variation of intense emotional attachments and lifestyles developing outside of the family of origin. All that means is that different siblings do different things. So here's, you know, Sally in her 20s. Now Sally may have an older sibling, a brother or a sister, who's say 25, early 30s, who's respectable in church, got a good career, you know. So what are you going to say to Sally? Why can't you be more like your older sibling? You see, in other words, it's a, a, it's a range and variation of emotional attachments among the siblings is a, is a range which the parent isn't prepared to accept and instead they're going to take one child who they think is, is, is going pretty much in the direction they want them to go and they're going to expect all their other children to be like that one. Well, that generally doesn't work. <laughs> you know, children don't like to be compared unfavorably with their siblings. So this, this parent, or this mother, or this father, has a big job on their hands, doesn't he? Now, you know, back here, their children all conformed. 
They all did what they were supposed to do at the right times and they all wore the clothes you wanted them to wear. Up here now, they're all very different and living perhaps very different lifestyles, very different kind of partners, very different kinds of careers. And now there's a whole, you see for the parent, it's blown wide open the range of what they consider to be acceptable to them. And, and their children have walked down this acceptable path and now that's been blown wide open and now the parent is having to cope with a wide range and variation of lifestyles and relationships among their children. Developing outside the family of origin beyond their control. How are they doing with that? So you might want to talk to them, ask some questions about that. Um, put another hand out here on uh, falling in love. Bit late. Bit late? Well, you've fallen out, fallen out of love, have you? Now, again, this is all secular research. Um, now, I'm sorry that it hasn't come out very well, but uh, I'm looking halfway down the pages there at the role of love. Now, remember we said that the, the most important task for the young adult is to find that relationship, to find that person with the X factor, to find that one that does it for them. That's, and they go, yes, this is the one. The role of love. A different approach to understanding the process of adult mating and bonding secular language, comes primarily from social psychologists who have tried to understand the differences among various types of adult relationships. The most compelling of these theories comes from Robert Sternberg who argues that love has three key components. So he's saying that love is made up of intimacy, passion and commitment. Intimacy which includes feelings that promote closeness and connectedness, Passion, which includes a feeling of intense longing with the other person, including sexual union. And commitment to a particular person, often over a long period of time. When these three component, components are combined in all possible ways, you end up with the eight sub-varieties of love listed on the table below. Just before we get to those, just notice that intimacy, according to Sternberg, intimacy isn't the same thing necessarily as sexual intimacy. Intimacy includes feelings that promote closeness and connectiveness. Now you can experience intimacy with someone which is not sexual. Intimacy in which, uh, and, and this is most commonly experienced between a counsellor and a seeker, where the intimacy that's experienced in the counselling relationship is an intim intimacy that comes when, when you perhaps for the first time in this person's life you are a person who is willing and able to step into their hearts, to step into their lives, to step into their circumstances and, and be a compassionate, sympathetic, non-anxious presence. Very, very, very powerful. Perhaps no one has ever taken the time to be that for them. Now that produces a, an, an intimacy and a trust and a counselling relationship which is very, very powerful and, and while certainly it has the potential to be misused, you can understand that, the intenseness of that counselling relationship provides an opportunity f for you as the counsellor to be able to speak into that person's life in a way that will bring long-lasting life change and that's whether they're a Christian or non-Christian. The intensity of that counselling relationship gives you access into that person that they've perhaps never given anyone else before. Now, what Sternberg is saying that that in in the uh, in this this task of the young adult to find a to find a mate that uh, there has to be something of that kind of intimacy there. Now, see, with a counsellor and a, and a and a and a seeker, uh, there's a power imbalance. And the power imbalance means that the, the counsellor is able to, if you like, um, develop and direct the relationship in ways that will ensure closeness, intimacy and, and a powerful connection. Simply because, you know, they've done it before and they know how to do it. They know the questions to ask, they know the responses to make, they know the amount of empathy to show and when to show it. Uh, now, what Sternberg is saying, that in a, 
in a romantic relationship, while the intimacy will not be of that perhaps intensity, and there certainly won't be the power imbalance, nevertheless, there has to be some element in which they feel a closeness and connectedness at a heart or emotional level uh, for them to be able to single this person out from all their other peers as being someone special. Um, uh, you know how that goes, this, um, this guy goes to this party and he's, he's a little bit socially awkward. He's not very good with talking with girls and at this party there's um, a lot of young people in the room and he's kind of standing over to one side, uh, over by the wall perhaps, and he's not saying much, he might have a drink in his hand and he's not drinking much of it and he's kind of looking out over this crowd and he doesn't really know what to do, he feels so very socially awkward and there's a girl there in the crowd who is the life of the party, very vivacious, uh, laughing, chatting to people, people are drawn to her, She's having a good time, the people around her are having a good time, and he's standing there and he's thinking, wow, wow, isn't she amazing? I could never get close to somebody like that. So he's standing there feeling, feeling very inadequate and very insecure and very like, um, uh, he likes to look from a distance, but to get any closer would be terrifying and dangerous. Meanwhile, this young lady is over here, the life of the party, and she's uh, uh, putting herself out there and, and people are flocking around and she's laughing and maybe drinking a bit and, and uh, laughing at the jokes and, and uh, perhaps flirting and uh, you know the guys are playing up to that. And in the midst of all of this she looks over and she sees this guy standing by the wall and she thinks to herself, hmm, that's an interesting looking guy. He doesn't seem to feel the need to to flirt and to party and to kind of prove himself. He seems to be, well, very secure and very kind of intact and solid looking, you see? And uh, so she just kind of, in the course of, she just kind of moves a bit closer to him, you see? <laughs> yeah, she wants to see what he's like, so she goes over and she says, hi. And meanwhile, he's here and he sees her getting closer and he's, he's getting terrified. She's gonna talk to me. What am I gonna say? So he plays it safe and says nothing. Which works, because she does all the talking. Because what she's been doing all night, right? So she comes home, she starts talking to him, and she's talking away, and, and she's laughing, and she's being gay and happy, and he's standing there and he's saying, wow, I've never met a woman as fantastic as this. And she's standing there saying, wow, this guy is just, he, he's not playing up to me, he's just so secure, and he's just so solid, and, and, and this is just so different, and, and there's someone that I could feel safe with. So before the evening's over, they're falling in love with each other for totally different reasons. Totally different reasons. So, uh, you see, there, there, there's, 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 there's the suggestion of intimacy. The suggestion is that, that I could be intimate with this person. Well, to finish the story very quickly, they get married and ten years later they come to see you, or five years later, or two years later they come to see you, and, and she's so frustrated with him because he won't share anything. He just never, never talks. And, and, you know, she tries hammering on his chest with her fist and, to get him to open up and he just, he's just, doesn't say anything because <laughs> he's just standing on the wall there, isn't he? Trying to play it safe but not saying anything. And, and, and of course, the more silent he gets, the more emotional she becomes, and which terrifies him, and, 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 and he's, he's mad with her because all she does is talk all the time. Talk, 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 talk. And you know, she ne never has any peace, never has any rest. You see, the very things that attracted them each other has now become the very things that are dividing them. So, you see, the, the intimacy <coughs> that is there is an intimacy uh, which includes feelings that promote closeness and connectedness, but that intimacy may change when the Mac truck of life runs over the marriage. So intimacy, passion, and commitment. Now here's the here's the eight varieties of love, and they're related to those three issues. Uh, Non-love, where none of these three component, components is present. So there's no intimacy, no passion, no commitment, and it describes most casual relationships or acquaintances. Now we all have people like that. People who we, we have in our lives, peers, and there's no, we don't love them in that romantic sense because none of those three are, are present. 
no intimacy, no passion, and no commitment uh, to a long, you know, to long-term relationship. And um, and you can see there's a there's a gradation here, going from non-love all the way down to consummate love. A liking, intimacy without passion or commitment, many friendships are in this category. Infatuation, passion without intimacy or commitment. Empty love, commitment without passion or intimacy describes some stagnant long-term marriages or friendships that have gone on for years but have lost mutual involvement and mutual attraction. Romantic love, passion and intimacy without commitment may be characteristic of the early stages of a relationship. Uh, companionate love, intimacy and commitment without passion may describe some long-term committed friendships or relationships with parents or other kin or with a partner with whom passion has waned. Fortuitous love, passion and commitment without intimacy, as in a whirlwind courtship, the commitment is based on passion rather than on intimacy, though intimacy may come later. Contrament love, all three components are present. And see the critical thinking there? Think about your own current and previous relationships, how would you classify each of them according to Stern Steinberg's system? Now, this is a helpful way to talk to, say, to non-Christians uh, uh, about their relationships and about the quality of their relationships. To use terminology like this that they can identify with and relate to as they trace the history of their relationship and what's happened. It's also uh, useful if you're involved in counselling uh, married couples and talking to them about the history of their relationship in terms of their intimacy, passion and commitment. What do you think about that stuff? Got anything going for it? Uh, might it give you a way forward when you're talking to someone? Here's this young adult. See, here's this young adult and, uh, and uh, they might be in your church and you're talking to them. 25 and they tell you they've just met this person and uh, they are started dating this person and they're just wondering about if this is going to be the one and um, uh, so you're um, and so you're going to talk to them about how could they know it's the one what sort of things about this person do they find attractive uh, in what ways do they think this person could meet their needs and what do they understand to be their greatest relational need are they looking for intimacy, passion, commitment? Uh, just over the page. Um, siblings also find themselves in realignment with the young adult. Siblings were the earliest and closest peers with whom there's been a shared history. This relationship is weakening as intimacy is sought outside of the family, hence it must be redefined. As adults, siblings will view their family history and dynamics differently from one another. So up until the, uh, the young adult begins to uh, experience freedom in relationships outside the family of origin, they're leaving behind uh, peers, siblings, with whom there's been a shared history and the ones that they've been the closest to, the peers they've been the closest to, and who know them the best. And now they're moving away. Uh, and as I said earlier, it can be quite a few years before that whole transition is redefined and settles down to a new set of relational dynamics. Um, and and what, what, what happens is when these, these, ad, these siblings, for instance, in adolescence, by the time they get to, say, middle adult, adulthood, and, uh, you know, the brothers and sisters are getting together so the cousins can play and, and the adults are sitting around talking and they might be talking about their parents and, and they might be talking about what it was like growing up and with the parents they had, that you find that, that each sibling has a very different impression and memory of the parents. And, and so one sibling may find, actually to their surprise, that their siblings didn't experience their parents the way they did. Or they're not hanging on to the issues that perhaps you're hanging on to. And, and uh, the dynamics are very different. Um, uh, here's an example from my own life. I'm one of five children. There were four boys and then there was a girl and I was the, I was the uh, fourth boy. And um, um, uh, my mother treated me as her favourite. Um, uh, I was when I was three months old. I got uh, meningitis, and and back then, early 50s, you know, uh, 
very dangerous and and I survived that obviously here I am flesh and blood um, and and so that kind of there was a bond there that my mother developed with me as a, as a very as an infant and so she also treated me always treated me as her favorite well of course my older sibling didn't like that and uh, and so now in adulthood when we get together my older brothers will talk very negatively about my mother it's almost like a um, a family tradition every time they get together they they beat up on mum now he's been dead about 30 years and and uh, uh, and I always feel very uncomfortable with that because that's not how I remember my mother. Um, so you see these family of origin issues, they never really go away. Uh, they're always having to be redefined and re-understood. So if you're talking to someone in their 20s and 30s, of course family of origin is very, very recent for them, but even, even down here, you see, family of origin issues are still there. And so here you are, you're talking to this mother who's probably about here, about Sally, who's gone to Sydney to live with her boyfriend, you see, and, and in the course of the conversation, the mother might say something like, I never did that when I was Sally's age. What's the implication? Why can't Sally be more like me? I never did that. What reason has Sally got for doing that? Oh, that's interesting. You never did that. Um, the reason you never did that, well, you never found anyone who you wanted to go to Sydney with. I mean, what, you didn't. You didn't. Well, I'd never have dreamt of disappointing my mother by doing something like that. Family of origin stuff. You see, she's still living out of her family of origin. She's still defining her life in terms of her mother's expectations. Certainly, in that area of her life. And now she's upset because Sally hasn't defined Sally's life in terms of her mother's expectations. Okay, probably time for a drink. Isn't Switch it? Let's on. have a break. Ready to go. A little bit more about mate selection. Um, it's a dreadful term, isn't it? But it's the one that's in the book that you're reading. Uh, <clears throat> dating is not a necessary precursor to a successful marriage as the growing divorce statistics would testify and as the success of arranged marriages will testify. Uh, <coughs> dating is not a necessary precursor any more than uh, uh, cohabitating is a necessary precursor to a successful marriage. Young adults may need help to understand their hearts on this issue. As arranged marriages testify, romance is not always a necessary precursor to mate selection. Some cultures disapprove of dating as a means of mate selection. What, what cultures come to mind that disapprove of dating? Pretty much every culture except ours? <laughs> Why do you think those cultures would disapprove of dating? What would be one reason? Well, the risk of sexual infidelity, certainly, but what would be... Uh, well, one of the primary reasons why they disapprove of dating is because of the loss of parental control over mate selection. If the young adult is free to go off and date, then the parents have no control over who they meet and who they hang out with. So, um, you know, in, in the most uh, dramatic of cases, you know, the young woman is kept at home and the parents decide who the young man is and they bring the young man to the woman. And that's it. Um, now, in, sorry, you want to say something? I was just thinking... You're allowed to. There's a lot of cultures, it's like there's no social security, so whoever she marries is going to be providing, supposedly, for them when they're older. Like, they're going to move in with the younger ones and be looked after, so... Whereas here, we've okay. got away from that because of, you know, tax and social security and stuff. Okay. So there's not quite the, um, so in the, uh, uh, the financial, long-term financial security of the, f of the whole extended family might be an issue here. Um, now, in, in some cases that I've been personally aware of here in South Auckland with uh, Indian cultures, for instance, uh, where, you know, there's a little bit of a mixture of a European or Kiwi influence coming in, um, the, um, uh, where the parents will say to the young lady, well, here's two or three guys to choose from. Or they might say, here's somebody that we approve of, but you can make your own decision. So uh, it's not dating, it's not an arranged marriage, but the girl's option has been somewhat limited. 
uh, but she's been left with the decision. So if she says, no, I don't want that one, the parents go out and find someone else, you see. Um, now, you just think about our churches, for instance, you know, um, a growing number of single women of marriageable age not getting married. Uh, is, uh, should we encourage them to date? Should we encourage them to go on um, online? Um, well, they're going to do that whether we encourage them or not. Should we be more proactive in uh, mate selection to help them out? Tell me, please. <laughs> What's the answer? <laughs> Steve Williams put I think, what was that called? I can't remember. But that got it, I thought he did really well with the belts of it. Okay. Sort of between dating, which I think a lot of crazy dating sort of stuff, and then courtship, he sort of took a line in the middle with his involvement from everyone, with consideration to everyone. Um, yeah. So that'll come out in his marriage and family course? I think he uses his book on that, doesn't he? Okay. So it's you see that it's it's a growing problem not only in in the church but see it's a growing problem for non-Christian families in our culture uh, how to help their young ones avoid uh, avoid being caught up in the sex saturated culture that we live in and and find uh, find lifelong companions that that work both for the child and for the extended family. Um, hence, you know, efforts to engage in, in, in cultural activities, for instance, uh, like the Indian culture and the Chinese culture and so on, and the Muslim cultures will have their own uh, activities and festivals designed to help their young people meet others of the same ilk. Uh, church functions much like that. But you see, for, for so much of New Zealand society, which is devoid of that strong cultural identity and devoid of any church identity, uh, it becomes becomes a real crisis for the family of origin as they see the young adult as it were cast adrift, uh, cast adrift on a on a random sea of chance possibilities and meetings. Um, I remember once some years ago uh, when my son was in his early twenties, he had a job as a waiter in a in a bar in the city, and um, Margaret and I decided to go down one night and visit him. And uh, you can imagine what that was like. This was two o'clock in the morning. There we were on Queen Street. And we couldn't believe the thousands and thousands of young people. Uh, late teens, early 20s, up into their 30s. This is the nightclubbing scene. Crowded in the bars, crowded out on the streets. Thousands of them, all up and down Queen Street. And we just kind of stood there with our gobsmacked. Because we were by far the oldest ones there, we didn't stay long. <laughs> we needed our sleep. But you see, this is this is this is what's happening. You, 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 This is where your children are finding their social contacts and outside of church community, um, outside of cultural community. So it's a crisis which we need to be aware of for the parents as much as for the young adult. Okay, um, courtship or dating can be a way of avoiding the fear of, and these are some reasons why uh, people get caught up in courtship and dating, the fear of making the wrong choice uh, if they don't, um, you know, why, why buy a book when you can join the library? You know, in other words, um, to ensure that you make the right choice, you know, you've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the handsome prince, that idea. Uh, the fear of failing in the relationship. In other words, um, to give me my, the best possible chance of succeeding in this in, in a relationship, I have to uh, uh, get some experience, get some mileage under my belt in lots of different relationships, and uh, in order to figure out who I'm most compatible with, who I work best with. Um, the uh, a fear of being hurt. If you stay too long in one relationship, maybe you get hurt, so you, you, uh, uh, you kind of, you're a player in the market, you see, and you're going from one to the other. Uh, you know, if, you, if the relationship goes on for too long, then, um, uh, you know, people start to f learn things about you that you really want to keep hidden. <coughs> a danger of intimacy. 
this could especially be if there's been problems in this area in the back here, perhaps with childhood sexual abuse, there's a real danger of, of intimacy, uh, a real fear of intimacy. Um, and often you see this uh, say a, a girl who's been sexually abused back here in infancy or in childhood and then it stops around about here somewhere and then through her adolescent years she kind of comes to terms with it and sort of puts it behind her and, and believes she's grown past it and then she comes into here and uh, now she's feeling the need to be involved with mate selection. So she starts dating and, and uh, the boy goes to kiss her and she freaks out. She starts screaming, for instance, or runs away. And, and of course the boy thinks, well, I won't try that again. Or he thinks, what's wrong with me? You know, do I have bad breath? You see, there's far more going on here. Now, you see, she finds herself having to respond sexually for the first time in her life since her abuse. See, through here there was no sexual intimacy. Now she's been called upon to move towards sexual intimacy. Or maybe he just tried to hold her hand. You see, he, she's been called upon to move into a relationship which, which has the prospect of sexual intimacy at some level. And at, suddenly she's right back here again. Because the last time she was sexually involved with someone it was an abusive situation terrifying and 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 she discovers to a horror that in fact she hasn't put it behind her it's really right there waiting to be triggered the next time someone was in any way uh, sexual towards her so you see that that young man man now becomes the new abuser or the new um, potential abuser why would he treat her any differently from her abuser when she was a child so uh, maybe uh, fear of inti intimacy might keep her um, f keep finding new relationships and then ditching them when they start to get too intimate, too close. A fear of desire or passion, um, or a fear of commitment. Becoming a couple is one of the most complex and difficult transitions of the family life cycle. Becoming a couple is one of the most complex and difficult transitions of the family life cycle. Um, now we're, we're going to do three, hour, three, three lectures, six hours on marriage, this term. And the reason is because becoming a couple is one of the most complex and difficult transitions and developing a marriage is one of the most complex and difficult of relationships. Because the person you're closest to is the one you sin against the most. Well, that's marriage. So uh, marriage is an extraordinarily difficult relationship to maintain, to grow, and to develop. And most of, I'll make a little prophecy here. Most, if, you, if you stay in counseling long term, most of your counseling will end up being with marriages. Or another way of saying that, it'll be relationship counseling. Um, to maintain a strong, stable, intimate relationship over a long period of years is an extraordinarily difficult achievement. Um, and uh, no one knows no one knows our parents better than we do. No one knows parents better than their children. And, and even in the best of, best of marriages, the children know that there are cracks, that there were, you know, there are unresolved issues, that um, how extraordinarily difficult it is. So becoming a couple is a complex and difficult transition, <laughs> but the crisis has only just begun. I can say that because you're all married. Mate selection is the most important task of really adulthood. It's a mysterious process. You know that mysterious verse in Proverbs 30? Proverbs 30, 18. There are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. 
Who can understand the romantic process? Who can understand what it is that attracts one person to another? Well, as parents see their young adults going out there, the parents are as amazed as anyone as to who their young people are attracted to. It's a mysterious process, heavily influenced by cultural norms. Cultures can be defined in terms of the power and control they exercise over this most important of tasks. If you want to know anything about a culture other than your own, ask the question, how does this culture treat marriage? How does this culture deal with mate selection? Because you see, every culture is heavily invested in mate selection. You can see why. You know, if, if they don't marry of the House of Israel, you see, you begin to dilute cultural distinctives and, and uh, hence the pressure on a, on a culture, particularly uh, minority cultures in New Zealand, for the young people to marry within that culture. And, uh, and in, a, in a Christian church culture, the pressure on the young people to marry within that church culture, within that Christian culture. Um, how does a culture deal with mate selection? That is the, uh, the crucible of the survival of that culture. Hence, you see, the, the, not only the parental involvement in mate selection, but the cultural norms surround that and what the culture expects of their young people in mate selection. Now, you know, I mean, all those traditions are um, at great risk in a postmodern culture like ours, where the expectation is that as the young adult moves into the 20s and 30s, they're going to experience ultimate freedom. Freedom from cultural norms, freedom from parental expectations, uh, freedom from uh, Christian traditional expectations, perhaps. There may not be a consensus between the parents and the young adults over mate selection. Well, it's a bit of an understatement, isn't there? Cultural expectations and personal preferences can often be in conflict. What qualities do individuals see in each other? Falling in love may have more to do with the perceived anticipated ability of the other to meet our needs. Now, my daughter married a Fijian Indian, who is the most wonderful son-in-law any man could hope to have. Uh, but um, his mother's involvement in that dating process was a sight to behold. See, very different culture from where Margaret and I came from. When they were, um, Rebecca and Lou were in high school together, when they were in high school, uh, the church that Lou was in had a, um, it's a strange sort of thing, but one night they had a thing where all the girls dressed up in their mother's wedding dresses and the boys had to go down the aisle with them. And it was basically showing off the mother's wedding dresses with the teenage girls, you see? Bit of a modelling, I guess. <laughs> well, Lou's mother set it up so that Rebecca would be the one. You know, that Lou would... See, they were just high schoolers. Already, way back there, you know, she was involved in mate selection. Well, as it turned out, it was a wonderful thing been a great marriage. He loves my daughter very much, so you can forgive a man a lot, can't you? When he loves your daughter that much. But it was, uh, what, what was fascinating was the different cultural involvement in that process. And uh, we, we tended to um, talk to Rebecca about it, but in a way that just kind of inquired and just encouraged her to talk to us about it without getting too involved, whereas his mother really got involved and put herself right in the middle of it. You have no idea what's up here. So, um, falling in love may have more to do with the perceived anticipated ability of the other to meet our needs. You know, remember the little story of the guy that was standing here, you know, in the life of the party? You see, they, they perceived in each other ability to meet their needs. Hence, that is, uh, centers around the falling in love. Now, you see, that falling in love, that romantic period actually doesn't last that long. You know, the whole falling in love thing, the romance, is something which begins around about, well, who knows when it begins, you know, but seriously, around 17, 18, 19, the whole falling in love thing, and then, you know, into your 20s, by the time you get to 30, you're a bit over it, aren't you? You're just a bit more jaded about life. And then you get into your, uh, <clears throat> into your 30s, and if you're still single, it's not so much romantic love you're looking for, it's uh, some things that are more down to earth. 
more practical, pragmatic concern. So that romantic period doesn't last that long, but you see the importance of it for any culture because it's in that romantic period that most mate selection is going to take place. That's when you're going to find the man or woman of your dreams. And romantic love plays a huge role in that, in that initial attraction. And it may be because you perceive the other one meeting your needs. Who knows what, what triggers it for you? And, and, uh, but out of that comes someone that you want to spend the rest of your life with. And out of that comes the necessity for marriage counselling. So be prepared. Uh, but you find if you, if you meet uh, people in their 30s, mid to late 30s, get into early 40s who are still single, um, and you talk to them about falling in love, they're just, they're over it. See, it, it really is just a passing thing. But very important, and, and, but it's a, it's a mysterious thing. You know, what triggers it, what causes it, is it all hormones, is it something else? It's a mystery, but it's an important mystery. Uh, mate selection has something to do with finding someone who is not too different from your expectations, which in turn relates to your view and experience of your parents, especially your opposite gendered parent. Um, now notice there I've said it's someone who's not too different from your expectations rather than someone who's not too different from your, from your culture. It, um, now I mentioned the the close relationship I had with my mother. One of the things that attracted me to Margaret was because she, she looks like my mother. She reminds me of my mother. You see that? My expectation was that in a marriage partner, my expectation was that I would find someone like my mother. Now I didn't want Margaret to be my mother, but the fact she looked like my mother made it easy for me to fall in love with her. Um, so you're experience of your opposite gendered parent. You see, the relationship the daughter has with her father will have a large bearing on the kind of man she's looking for. It might, see, she might want someone like her father or unlike her father. Again, the relationship that the uh, young adult male has with his mother will have a large bearing, perhaps, on who he's looking for in terms of uh, someone to marry. Um, It might be, you see, like in my case, when there's a very strong attachment, you're, you're looking to continue that. You don't want to lose that. You see, so in, in moving away from my family of origin, I was moving away from a woman who loved me richly and dearly, but at times too much. I had to get away. I had to get away. A smothering. But it was nice. Now, in leaving that behind, I didn't want to lose it altogether. So I realised I could only go back so many times before I really did have to leave. And so I looked for it in someone else. And um, Margaret, in her godliness and spiritual maturity, is determined not to be my mother and not to let me be the little boy around her, and she insists that I grow up and be a man, and, and, which is all great everything what I need, but you see how easily I could slip into that little boy thing and, and just let her mother me because it felt so good when I was back here. It felt so good, very comforting, very safe, very warm. Um, relationship with our opposite gendered parent. It may be that uh, a boy has grown up with a very harsh mother or a girl has grown up with a very harsh father. And so they, they come to young adulthood with a sense of deprivation, with a sense of having missed out on something in their growing up years, missed out on some kind of parental blessing because of the opposite gendered parents' perceived inability to love and parent them the way the child expected and wanted. And so now the child goes out and makes selection looking for another go-round looking for another bite at the cherry, looking for perhaps a man who will make up for me what my father never gave me, or a woman who will make up for me what my mother never gave me. And so you go into marriage with that expectation. Um, hence, uh, you know, the, 
the ultimate insult is to be told by your spouse that you're just like your father or you're just like your mother. Because there's a sense in which you want to distance yourself from that, but not so much that it doesn't influence and have an impact on your mate selection. So if you have a very close relationship with your parents then, you see it's going to be very important to you that the person that you marry is someone who is able to develop a similarly close relationship with your parents. If you have a conflicted relationship with your parents, then it's less important for you and your mate selection that you have someone that gets along with your parents. You don't really expect them to because you never did. But if you did, you expect them to because you did. It becomes more difficult though when you are close to one parent but not the other parent, and if it happens to be the, uh, the opposite gendered parent, then uh, that's going to get in the way of the ones you choose to date. I say all this to give you a way forward in your counselling, things to look out for, questions to ask, just to be aware as they're talking to you about their, perhaps their dating difficulties. Someone might come to you and they're, say, 25 and their 30s, you know, they're uh, having trouble finding a, someone to spend their life with, they've been dating, it never hasn't worked out, they've come for some help, come for some counsel. You see, these are all avenues that you can explore, all ways that you can go down in order to in order to develop a counselling relationship of trust and intimacy where they will begin to share their life with you so that you can help them perhaps to come to a more clearer understanding of their own hearts of what's driving their mate selection. There might be unresolved issues back here with family of origin which if they can see are getting in the way might make it, um, it might enable them not only to reconcile with the parents but actually grow up and mature in this whole process of mate selection. Mate selection has something to do with being ready to get married. Uh, different from the desire to be married. The desire to be married can be different from being ready to be married. Like for instance, uh, uh, you know, here's the, um, here's the adolescent girl who dreams about her wedding day. You know, there's a desire to be married but not a, not a readiness. It's not time to be married. And um, uh, and 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 so, when you're ready to get married, it's the person who is closest to you in that time of readiness comes. So you get to that point where you say, "Well, I'm ready to get married now." Okay, who, who's 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 close, who's around there? Who's around? Up until then, you may not have been looking at the people around you in terms of a potential mate, but now within yourself, in your clock. You're, you'll say, well, I'm ready, I, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to be married, okay, who's out there? And it just who happens to be there at the time? There might have been a very suitable person that was in your life a year or so ago and who your mother was very hopeful about and you weren't ready and now you are ready and that person's gone but there's someone else. I hesitate to tell this story because it makes me look like a bit of a doofer. But you see, um, all through my 20s, I was very heavily involved in Christian ministry and it didn't do any dating at all, wasn't interested. And it was very much, for me, it was very much a time in which I went from not being interested to being intensely ready for marriage. And when that time came, there was Margaret. So it has to be of the Lord, right? You see, when I was ready, she was there and she was ready. But if I'd met Margaret five years before, or three years before, you see, it, I wouldn't have seen her in that light at all. Now, research has shown, as I've put here, uh, interestingly, a high percentage of people marry within a year of some significant event which contributes to their readiness. Now, you might like to think about that in terms of uh, how you met your own spouse. Uh, what was going on in your life right about the time you first met them? Was there some event which brought you to a state of readiness which said, okay, and it may be, it may be meeting that person themselves brought you to that point of readiness. Maybe they, they brought you there or maybe you got there and looked around and there they were. But certainly there was a, uh, there was a time in which you were ready and before that time you weren't ready. You may have desired to be married but The stars, the, the planets hadn't lined up. Or, if you like, um, mate selection has a lot to do with God's providential work in our lives. He does bring people across our paths 
at a time when he's ready for us uh, to be married. Uh, but it'll probably happen, most often it'll happen during the young adult age stage. The task of the young adult, young adult is mate selection. Now, you see we're created for maturity and God has set it up so that when we go through these life stages, this is the life stage of mate selection. It's not our culture telling us that, it's the way God has set it up because you see this is the age in which we're ready to have children, you see? And so we move into middle adulthood with babies and into young old with teenagers and by the time we get to here we're financially able to support our grandchildren and help out. You see, it's, it's beautiful. If all the relationships stay intact, it's just blessing upon blessing. Romance and marriage can be incompatible since romance is an escape from reality while marriage is a confrontation with reality. In romance, you're running from reality and you run straight into it by getting married. So love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. Yet romance at the beginning stages of mate selection can assist greatly in the eventual establishment of a mutual sexual relationship and bond of affection. The scriptures speak to the necessity of selecting a mate who loves Jesus Christ. What do the scriptures have to say about dating? Is such trial and error necessary? Okay, what do you think about that? Is such trial and error necessary for Christians? If you're going to say to your children when the time comes, dating is not a good thing, and they're going to say to you, well, mum, how, how am I going to meet the guy I'm going to marry? You better have a plan. What are you going to say? I think that the term trial and error is, could have a lot of different meanings for different people. It's in inverted commas. <laughs> yes, you can put your own one in there. I think it's kind of, dating was so loaded when I was young, like it wasn't, I mean I think there is a, that can be too casual you just, everyone's dating everyone, um, but kind of by the time, what well, yeah, sort of New Zealand culture, Christian culture was, you know, if you even took someone out it was kind of like, woo, you know, woo, they're serious sort of thing. Especially, no, especially if you shared a hymn book in the morning service, that was a sure thing. No, it was just like there was no way to be friends with a girl without there being all these expectations. Okay. Um, so if dating, I think, like just take them for being going to take a girl like for a coffee and not make it a big event. You know, don't plan it all. It's not like moving and all that. It's just like low investment on each side. Well, I'll invest them on your side. What about her? How's she taking the coffee? Oh, Andrew wants to marry me. No. It's more a... Uh, anyway, getting rid of all that the pressure is just so intense often. So people actually don't do it. Like, they wait until they really can't not ask her out because it's so wound up, you know? Okay. And then it's kind of like... You've idealised someone to the point where you're already kind of in love with them. And you don't even know them. No. Um, it's not very so, realistic. So what are you going to say? What are you going to say to this uh, young adult who comes to you and the dating game hasn't really worked for them? Well, they come to you wanting your input on the whole dating scene and mate selection. Uh, what are you going to advise them regarding dating? All their friends are dating, they all have boyfriends or girlfriends, and they don't. I kind of think if, if they're personally interested in serving the Lord and they kind of figured out their talent or the areas where they like to serve, then that's the, probably the best place to find someone who's going to be a good fit. Like, so just keep on helping others and then keep your eyes open for who else is there, so rather than just date anyone because they're a Christian sort of, sort of actually put 
filter it into people that have the same interest. So you'd encourage them to um, do group stuff together with people their own age? Yeah. Well, by the time they get to 25, they might be a bit past that. Yeah. I think it's not so much about what are the right rules for kind of dating. I think it comes down to heart issues and attitudes. Okay. It's the way, the problem with what there's this culture around us which says you should choose a person who's the most beautiful or, or m most strong, or they've got all these very physical um, requirements for, for for someone you should go out with or, or spend your life with. And I think it's important first to get those attitudes correct. So mm -hmm. realizing that the, um, the person that you, uh, you, need, you need to look for is someone, firstly, who, who loves the world, secondly, it's um, someone who is desiring commitment and, and desiring a, a, that sort of relationship, not a, a quick thing. So yeah, there's all sorts of things you need to sort out an, an attitude first. Right? Okay, so you'd be asking them lots of questions to try to understand where they're coming from in some of those areas. Mm -hmm. To understand the heart issues. You're quite right, so it comes down to heart issue, doesn't it? If in their hearts, are they, is their commitment to Christ such that they can trust Him? without resorting to sinful trial and error. Yeah, it's kind of about who are they trying to please? Are they trying to please their culture or their parents or themselves or God? Like? So then when you, there is that trial and error, I think it's not a sinful trial and error because you've already mm. got, you've got, got to get rid of all the wrong reasons and you've got two people who are, who are honestly wanting to serve God, wanting to love God, wanting to have a, a long-term commitment and then they spend some time together and they decide we, we can't we can't make that commitment together we, 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 we really want to make a, 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 relation, a relationship with someone but for whatever reason it's, it's not going to be that person and, and they're still able then to to move on to another relationship within a, a short amount of time without leaving guards of pain and so it's a how do you do that perfectly? I don't know, but it's, uh, I've, I've seen, seen it happen. I don't know how it happens. Remember it says in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, instructions on single people together, uh, not to um, defraud mm. the unmarried. And, um, you know, not to take from them that which belongs to a, to a marriage union. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there's great counsel there in, in, um, for these people not to, not to get uh, physically involved with one another because that's something that belongs within marriage and, and that you're really defrauding them and you're defrauding whoever they eventually marry. So I think Mark is, is quite right to be able to have a relationship such that if you went your separate ways there'd be no regrets and you could look them in the eye down the few years later and and uh, you know when they've got their spouse and family, you've got your spouse and family and there's no reason to be shameful or guilty or regretful over the way you conducted yourselves. Uh, that's very important. So heart issues. Now this, because this is such an emotive issue, emotionally charged issue, the heart issue is absolutely paramount isn't it, that, uh, that they're conducting themselves before God as his child and um, seeking to honour him in all their relationships. And uh, you see, for, for, the Christian, for the Christian young adult, you know, the huge temptation is, well, yeah, trusting God's fine, but what if, I, what, I'm, what if I'm still single at 45? You know, should I do something to help out here? You know, to increase my chances. It's a hard one, isn't it? Well, there's certain things you can do, but, but the basic thing is to be that heart God with God. And sort of willing. Well, I think trusting that God knows what's best and that you might not. But, I mean, I need to learn that through stuff ups, basically, but. If you can instill, if we can show that by the way we live to our kids and young people that 
Well, telling us our stories, good and bad, so that they can see where how God worked in other people's lives, and then they can perhaps see the signs or evaluate their own relationship because it will be got a little bit of an idea what looks good and what doesn't look good. Like, and I think the speaking the truth, um, being truthful is a real part of it, like not misleading someone by not saying things or else by saying things that you really can't commit to. Like, you know, guys tend to you know, promise, promise what they're really not going to have any intention of giving to get you know, the girl to stay with them or whatever. But, if, you know, if she really knew what they were about, she wouldn't be there. And so that whole side of it, being very truthful. Um, okay, being very honest. Yes. Yeah, and, and keeping talking about the relationship as it develops, not just that whole suicide sort of thing. Okay, so first, uh, um, you're talking about the second hour that's come to talk to you. Uh, that you're, you're in your counselling, you're going to uh, be wanting to help them to see the issues, the drivers, the motivations in their own heart, what's going on in their own heart. Uh, uh, where are they trusting God in this issue? Where aren't they? And then you're going to want to talk to them about um, honesty and integrity in every relationship that they have. And, uh, you know, to honour Christ in the relationship. Uh, so they become uh, self-imposed um, boundaries, yeah. which they won't cross or allow anyone else to cross. And the counselling relationship could be a good sort of introduction to that, like how you're truthful in that relationship, the kind of truthfulness that they should hopefully aspire to, to find how freeing it is and how safe it feels. That's then what they they wouldn't want anything different. Okay. So in the counselling relationship, uh, uh, there's the possibility for them to exercise that degree of honesty and truthfulness with you and, 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 and it not destroy them. In fact, it sets them free, as Jesus said. Which raises the issue of, you know, if, if you're counselling uh, a young adult, um, the... Uh, uh, probably better that a guy counsels a guy and a girl counsels a girl in this situation, talking about these issues. Um, or um, you have your spouse with you when you're doing it, perhaps something like that. So there's the hard issues, there's the not defrauding one another and, and uh, um, to the pure, all things are pure, and there's the uh, Um, dealing with the expectations of family of origin and culture. You know, the feeling like, um, oh, if I don't get married, in this church I'm a second class person if I'm single. There's nothing much here for singles. Everyone's married and having children. And, and you see there's a huge expectation there that they can feel. So you just got to process that with them. Um, Often, often talking about that expectation can go a long way to helping them live with it. You, you may not be in a position to change the expectation of the church, uh, of the Christian environment, but if they can talk about it, and if they can find a, a and, 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 and get an empathetic response from you as they talk about it, you're not going to minimise it or dismiss it or contradict it or rebuke them for it, but instead you're, you're going to agree with them that yes, it can be very hard, and, and in talking about that, they're, they're giving voice to something that they feel very intently and hear, and as that's, as that's talked about, it, 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 it diminishes as, in their own minds and hearts as, something, as, as an obstacle uh, to living the Christian life. And, and uh, you know, every single person, doesn't matter how old they are, you know, even a, a widow or a widower who finds themselves single up here is going to feel in the Christian community a, a kind of a... Um, that they're not just quite where everyone else is. That um, and they'll tend to no, they'll tend to hang out together, have their own midweek worship service, perhaps. You see, because there's there's a commonality there. Well, for for this one here, you see, it's that that singleness to be single in church community is a difficulty, and it's a difficulty which the, will always be there. The so 
You see, it's not to somehow remove the difficulty, but they help them to live with it, in spite of the difficulty. Um, okay, another one is, uh, uh, what ministry opportunities can they be involved in, even now, while they're, uh, you know, as a young adult, so that mate selection doesn't become the only thing that fills up their life, but there's other things like ministry, serving others, which is also a significant part of their life that they can find fulfillment in. So all their expectations for fulfillment in life is not piled into finding the right person to get married to. Okay, any other comments? Isn't that um, the whole idea that within young, uh, young adulthood that early adulthood, that expectation that there needs to be that finding of a, of, of a mate or a, a life partner. Life partner. Mm. Isn't, isn't that an expectation in itself? Isn't that, a, isn't that kind of um, our culture saying this is what you need to do? Is that, a, is that a biblical expectation? Is that what you're asking? Um, I guess that's one, one question. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's then how yeah okay well I'll first ask that question <laughs> <laughs> so it, it could be a cultural expectation a family of origin expectation a, uh, a, a, a church culture expectation but is there a biblical expectation that you find a mate in the young adult stage now the secularists are telling us this is the, great, the big task of the young adult is to find a mate and, and certainly there's a lot of cultural pressure to do that but Biblically, is that the primary task of the young adult? Young Christian adult, is that their primary task? I think the scripture talks quite a bit about it. Um, man shall leave his father and mother, cling to his wife, and be fruitful and multiply. So it's certainly in there, isn't it? That that's a big task of most adults. Is it an expectation of an individual? Certainly, the expectation of of mankind in general to to be able to to multiply as it were. But so this is the age stage that's most likely to happen. But isn't the the biggest expectation in scripture that every human must, or every person must glorify God and join forever? Mm. So often we, in, in church situations, we have all these things that we we say are good, and we almost put them before mm. the most important things. Mm. Okay, so what's the primary task for the Christian young adult? Jesus didn't get married, so he <laughs> <laughs> And the prophet, there were certain prophets that didn't. He didn't have to live a life of singleness, though. No. Um, well, Paul kind of, that initial mandate, you know, the nation of Israel and all that ongoing and that was to wait for the Messiah to come from that, so they had to have a nation, sort of. And then Paul's kind of changed it, where he talks about, you know, being married isn't the be-all and end-all of it. It's good to serve the Lord, but you're freer as a single person, even possibly. So he's sort of, he's not going against marriage. But he's allowing a place for singleness. Yeah, definitely. Within the church culture. Okay, so what should be... He's validated it, totally. Right. Yeah, exactly. So now, see, what... I've said here, quoting the secular literature, that the primary task for the young adult is mate selection. Now, we got, we, we, biblically, we need to push back on that, right? What's the primary task for the young adult? It's to, it's to love God with all their heart, soul, strength and mind and their neighbours themselves. Now that's the requirement at any age stage. So the question is, what does that look like at this age stage that's particular or distinctive to this age stage? And of course, immediately, to love God and to love neighbour, what does that look like at this age stage? Well, what does that look like when we're at the age stage where mate selection takes place? It doesn't take place down here, it looks differently down here. So what does it mean to love God and to love neighbour in the midst of this Cultural, biological, whatever. Clock, driver's expectation. Um, to put God ahead of mate selection. To trust God. Now, you see, we shouldn't underestimate the difficulty of that requirement for the young adult. 
See, every age stage has its own challenges in terms of Christian maturity. Remember, created for maturity. So for a young adult, you know, to, to trust God in this area of mate selection is a huge thing that we're asking of them. Well, that the scriptures are asking of them. A huge thing that God is asking of them. To offer that up to him and to wait on him. Oh, well, it's all right for you. You got married at that age. What if I don't? You see, it's a, it's a very intense spiritual battle for the young adult. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't back away from that and in our counselling be willing to walk with them through the anxieties and the fears and the uncertainties of the intensity of that battle. I think the church kind of has to, I mean, if you want people to wait on God for things like that, then they need to already know how to wait on God for lesser things, you know, all this sort of significant thing. And so you have to model that as a church and as parents, like, what, well, all the way how through do here. you wait on God? All the way through here, they should be yeah, learning that. How does that. our church, how do mm. my elders wait on God when there's an issue? Like, do they push through on their own? That there needs to be that willingness to, to, to take on that responsibility that, that is involved with having a, a lifetime a partner. You mean that you're talking about the young adult? Yes. To so take on the responsibility so of. I, I think Oh right, to be to be proactive in some sense. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that sort of stand up and go, "Oh, look at all these, uh, these single women and the single men. Oh, they're so useless. Just if they get any, get off their butts and get together, and it'll be, it all will be solved." But I think uh, it, it's not about for them first getting off their butts and, and going together. It's individually relying upon God and being willing. And God may not choose all those people to. He has He has got different. Ideas for it. So it's like we've got to look on and can be very critical, particularly for those who are already married. But I think it's, yeah, it's important to really, to really encourage those people who are single. And uh, even by so encouraging them, um, there, there will be many that will be more inclined to. So, so what you've been talking about is the end goal of your counselling with a, with a young adult single. You know, where, you know, and that's, we've been talking about where you'd want to get with them. We listed those things. And, uh, but as we do that, we don't want to underestimate the struggle that it is for them. It's very hard for us to put ourselves back there, and the struggle that it was for us. It, it's really intense, and we have to really be able to empathise with them. I remember in my early 20s, I said, well, Martin Luther, he was, he was married at 40, so God, 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 he, he would be able to choose the but he took a vow of chastity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly, yes. There's still the expectation that, you know... Didn't he go into the nunnery in the middle of the night and carry her off? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's proactive. <laughs> but, uh, our church sort of has this, has this expectation that you have to be a certain way. And you have all these examples throughout history of people relaxing. Were, uh, acting in totally the opposite ways that they, they should have, and yet it still worked out. Very good. We must pray. Father God, uh, <coughs> we're so grateful to you for the way that you have blessed us and encouraged us, and um, and you have led us, particularly through these tumultuous years, tumultuous for the young adult, with their emotions and their desires often in conflict and and uh, carrying them in directions where they really don't want to go and ought not to go and and uh, yet uh, you're wanting to be independent and yet needing advice and counsel it's just a very difficult and 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 we have to bear with that as 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 leaders and in in our churches and 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 older and mature Christians we have to bear with that tumult that the young ones are going through without being judgmental and without um, so father we pray you just give us hearts of love and 
and, and intimacy and, and empathy and understanding and wisdom that we can develop relationships with them such that that uh, that we can speak into their lives words of encouragement and hope to stand fast in Jesus Christ and to trust him and uh, so father we thank you for the way you've answered the prayer we prayed at the beginning and of this evening and we ask that as we continue to reflect on our own life experience, as we continue to reflect on the scriptures, as we continue to reflect on, on the messages of our culture and we meet people in our churches and outside of our churches who are caught up in those cultural pressures, we ask, Father, that you would, you would help us bring a word of love and a word of clarity and a word of comfort and hope, both to these young adults and to their families of origin caught up in the crisis and transition of mate selection. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.